on World News Tonight. Shutdown averted. Make or break moment for the US President's trillion dollar plan. Climate calamity. Japan battered by heavy rain and winds as Typhoon Mindula passes by. Awaited freedom. Australian border to reopen for the first time since the pandemic. Welcome to Wonderland. Disney Resorts celebrate 50 years of magic and excitement. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the fiscal disagreements in America. Congress steps away from the cliff, racing to beat a midnight deadline as both chambers voted to avert a shutdown and fund the government through December 3rd. Furthermore, Democrats are desperately trying to overcome internal division and rescue two of Biden's major priorities. The bill is passed. A shutdown crisis averted tonight. The motion is adopted. The House and Senate easily passing a bill to fund the government through December, hours ahead of a midnight deadline. But now the divide deepening among Democrats still struggling to pass President Biden's signature spending plans. It's got to come together. Key moderate Senator Joe Manchin wants to pass a trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure bill first, making clear he won't support the president's $3.5 trillion climate and social policy bill, slamming it as fiscal insanity that could lead to a, quote, entitlement mentality arguing for the price tag to be cut by two trillion dollars. I've never been a liberal in any way, shape or the form. I guess for them to get theirs, elect more liberals. But don't, I'm not asking them to change. I'm willing to come from zero to one five. But progressive Democrats in the House have been threatening to vote no on that bipartisan bill unless the Senate comes to an agreement on the larger spending plan. I can't tell the senator what to say, obviously, but all I can say is we've said that we're going to stay here all weekend if we need to, to see if we can get to a deal. Speaker Pelosi taking Manchin's concerns in stride. We're talking about substance. We're not talking about rhetoric and we're not even talking about dollars. We're talking about what is important in the legislation. Where can we find our common ground? House moderates still believe they can send the infrastructure bill to President Biden tonight. Paying thousands of dollars and shunning popular routes, Haitian migrants are making their way to the border city of Tijuana, Mexico, with the help of fellow Haitians who reached the doorstep of the U.S. five years ago during another spike in migration. As thousands of Haitian migrants were detained, deported or expelled from an impromptu border camp built along the Texas-Mexico border last week, many others traveled west to the border city of Tijuana hoping to avoid a crackdown aimed at stemming the rising tide of migrants, fleeing recent natural disasters and political upheaval that have ravaged Haiti in recent months. Many forced to pay thousands of dollars to evade detection and avoid popular routes. Fellow Haitians who reached the doorstep of the United States five years ago, however, have become a valuable resource for those fleeing the country this time, smoothing the pathway north. Since July, the network has also helped some Haitians to cross into the United States. His journey mirrors that of predecessors who first fled a major 2010 earthquake in Haiti and chronic poverty for South America. Many then moved north en masse for the United States in 2016. Settling in various parts of Tijuana, some Haitians work in restaurants and factories, while others have businesses ranging from cell phone shops to car washes, gardening, plumbing, and interior decoration. Felix Diem arrived in Mexico from Haiti nine years ago and has been living in Tijuana for a year. He is a worker at a local factory. I am working here. I don't want to leave to go to the U.S. Recently, a lot of my compatriots crossed the border and many of them were deported. I can live well here as well, as long as I'm working. Reuters spoke to more than 20 Haitians and Mexicans in Tijuana, who said they were advising new Haitian arrivals where to stay or had offered them rooms to rent themselves. Baja, California, the state where Tijuana lies, has traditionally been one of the fastest growing in Mexico. And the local labor minister told the Haitians are welcome. A powerful typhoon has pounded Japan and some of its eastern islands with gusts and downpours of rain, drowning some domestic flights and halting trains. Let's cross over to other Verna World News correspondent Anjali Vijayaratna reporting from Fukuoka in Japan for more. Anjali? Yes, Anradi. The Tokyo area was getting heavy rains and blowing winds, but no injuries were being reported. 
typhoon Mindu was near one of the Isu Islands off Tokyo's southern coast, moving northeast at a speed of about 35 km and packing winds of up to 160 km per hour. Some local train services in Chiba and other prefectures east of Tokyo were temporarily suspended. Several flights and ferries connecting Tokyo's Haneda Airport and outer islands have been also cancelled. Chief Cabinet Secretary Katsu Nobukato told reporters that no damages or injuries have been reported so far. He also urged Isu Islanders to stay indoors and avoid going near glasses, glass windows until the typhoon passes. Rains of up to 200 mm are predicted on the Izu Island and 150 mm in the Tokyo region by tomorrow. The Meteorology Agency cautioned residents in the affected areas against possible flooding and mudslides. Back to you, Andradi. All right, thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Anjali Vijayaratna reporting from Fukuoka in Japan. Former French President Nicolas Sarkozy is to find out whether he faces a second jail term when a court returns its verdict over massive overspending on his 2012 re-election campaign. Former French President Nicolas Sarkozy was found guilty of illegal campaign financing by a Paris court on Thursday for overspending on a failed 2012 re-election bid but he's unlikely to serve the one-year sentence he was handed. His lawyer said he'd appeal, effectively suspending it. And the judge said he could serve the term at home with an electronic tag. But it was his second guilty verdict this year. And a stunning fall from grace for a man who led France from 2007 to 2012 and still holds sway among conservatives. His Conservative Party spent nearly double the 22.5 million euros, that's currently 19.2 million dollars, allowed under electoral law, prosecutors said. It held extravagant campaign rallies, then hired a friendly public relations agency to hide the cost. Sarkozy has denied wrongdoing. He told the court in June he hadn't been involved in the logistics of his campaign for a second term, or in how money was spent during the election run-up. But the court said Sarkozy was made aware of the overspending and didn't act on it, and that he didn't have to approve every spend to be responsible. Several others were found guilty of fraud over the campaign financing and sentenced to up to three and a half years in jail and hefty fines. In March, Sarkozy was found guilty of trying to bribe a judge and peddle influence in order to obtain confidential information on a judicial inquiry. He also denied any wrongdoing in that case, in which he was sentenced to three years in jail, two suspended. But an appeal means he hasn't actually spent time in prison yet. The two convictions could force Sarkozy to play a more discreet role in next year's presidential election. He wasn't planning to be a candidate, but as a popular figure on the right, he'd be expected to support his party's choice. North Korea claims to have test-fired a new anti-aircraft missile. The launch took place some 24 hours after the North expressed an interest in restoring severed inter-Korean communication channels. However, despite the South's efforts this morning, its calls north of the border went unanswered. North Korea fired a newly developed anti-aircraft missile on Thursday, the latest in its recent series of weapons tests. That's according to state media KCNA on Friday. This marked the country's second known missile test within a week after it launched a never-before-seen hypersonic missile on Tuesday. Pyongyang has also fired ballistic missiles and a cruise missile with potential nuclear capabilities in recent weeks, shedding light on its steady development of sophisticated weapons as denuclearization talks with the United States stall. KCNA added that Thursday's new missile features technologies that boost its responsiveness, guidance accuracy, and distance of downing air targets. Pyongyang has argued that these tests aim to boost self-defense capabilities just as others do, accusing the U.S. and South Korea of, quote, double standards and hostile policy. Thursday's test follows North Korean President Kim Jong-un's offer earlier this week to reopen severed inter-Korean hotlines, adding that he has no reasons to attack their southern neighbor. Instead, Kim slammed the U.S. for using, quote, more cunning ways and methods by pursuing hostile policy while also proposing talks. The Biden administration has said it has no hostile intent toward North Korea and has called on Pyongyang to resume talks. 
Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back and on to the update of the COVID crisis. Australia will reopen its international border from November, giving long-awaited freedoms to vaccinated citizens and their relatives. To get more on details on this, other than a World News special correspondent, Timothy Phillip joins us now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, Anurali. Since March 2020, Australia has had some of the world's strictest border rules, even banning its own people from leaving the country. The policy has been praised for helping to suppress COVID, but it has also controversially separated families. At present, people can leave Australia only for exceptional reasons, such as essential work or visiting a dying relative. Entry is permitted for citizens and others with exemptions, but there are tight caps on arrival numbers. This has left tens of thousands stranded overseas. Reopening the international border for citizens and permanent residents will be linked to the establishment of home quarantine in Australia's eight states and territories. Morrison said, meaning that some parts of the country will reopen sooner than others. The first phase of the plan will focus on citizens and permanent residents being allowed to leave Australia with further changes expected to permit foreign travellers to enter the country. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News special correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. The organizers of the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics have announced that due to the continued fear of COVID-19, tickets to watch the action will only be sold to Chinese people from the mainland. This also means that foreign athletes, family and friends will not be allowed in China to watch it live. Unlike the recent Tokyo Games, the Beijing Winter Olympics will allow spectators, but only if they live in mainland China. While acknowledging the disappointment felt by fans around the world, the International Olympic Committee welcomed the decision to host Chinese spectators after the Tokyo Olympics took place in early empty stadiums due to the pandemic. Athletes and event officials who are not fully inoculated will be subject to a three-week-long quarantine upon their arrival in Beijing. Fully vaccinated people will be exempt from the quarantine. That will make room for high-ranking foreign officials to engage in some diplomacy during the 16-day event. According to the IOC, Beijing's safety principles include a so-called closed-loop management system that keeps all game participants in designated zones. This covers stadiums, accommodation, as well as the opening and closing ceremonies, which are all served by a dedicated transfer system. On top of that, all domestic and international athletes, coaches and staff must take COVID-19 tests daily when they're in Beijing. For the specific policy details, Beijing 2022 will release the first and second versions of its playbooks in late October and December, respectively. With just four months left until the Olympics start, watchers say Beijing's ambitious goal of holding an exciting but safe Games will lay groundwork for a successful start to President Xi Jinping's third term, which is expected to start in autumn 2022. While some major companies are firing employees for refusing to get vaccinated, the vast majority of workers have chosen to comply. There could be more legal challenges coming with vaccine deadlines for Chicago City employees and Los Angeles School District. As Los Angeles now considers one of the country's strictest COVID vaccine mandates for indoor venues, and San Diego has just approved a new one for students and staff, supporters of the crackdown say they're working. Nationwide, while some major companies are firing employees for refusing to get vaccinated, the vast majority of workers have chosen to comply. At one medical system in Kansas City, Missouri, less than 1% of employees lost their jobs. At Houston Methodist, about half a percent did. In North Carolina, Novant Health also says 99% of its staff across 15 medical centers have gotten vaccinated or have been approved for medical or religious exemptions. But more legal challenges are underway. Today at New York Supreme Court, five health care workers and a state legislator argued the state's mandate is invalid. Next month could be the biggest test yet as other vaccine deadlines are fast approaching. 
October 15th for city employees in Chicago and for the nation's second largest school district, Los Angeles. Right now, about one in five employees there, some 12,000 workers, have not gotten their first dose. The district already has 2,000 vacancies. We have some good news for you. Somalia has taken a step towards saving many more lives as the country opened its first ever public oxygen plant to better manage the COVID crisis. Somalia's first public oxygen plant opened on Thursday. A sigh of relief for a country where life-saving oxygen has been largely unavailable. The plant, installed in the Banadir Maternity and Children's Hospital in Mogadishu, was bought from Turkey for more than $240,000 by the Hormuz Selam Foundation, established by the country's largest telecoms company, Hormuz. Hormuz Foundation CEO Abdullahi Noor Osman said there were already a number of private plants selling oxygen in Mogadishu. He said oxygen from the new plant would be distributed among public hospitals in the capital free of charge. Hormuz has also paid to repair the COVID wing where the oxygen plant is located, which was partially destroyed during an attack by Al-Shabaab militants in July. The global health crisis has underlined the desperate shortages of oxygen in many countries. In May, a study published by medical journal The Lancet said that Africans seriously ill from COVID-19 are more likely to die than patients elsewhere because of a lack of oxygen and other equipment. Project engineer Onur Ozkan said another plant is on Somalia's horizon. As of Wednesday, Somalia had reported nearly 20,000 COVID-19 cases and more than 1,000 deaths, according to the WHO. Figures could be higher due to inadequate testing and unreported deaths. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau drew criticism for flying to the West Coast on holiday on the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, honouring the lost children and survivors of Indigenous schools. Protesters took to the streets of Canada's most populous city, Toronto, on Thursday, marking the country's inaugural holiday in honour of the lost children and survivors of Indigenous schools. The National Day of Truth and Reconciliation was established in June by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who was facing major backlash for going on vacation instead of attending several key events marking the holiday. The holiday was created after more than a thousand unmarked graves were found near two schools earlier this year. On Thursday, protesters wore shirts reading Every Child Matters and flecked the streets with the color orange, the symbol of that initiative. The so-called residential school system, which was active from the 1800s to 1996, removed more than 150,000 indigenous children from their families with the stated aim of assimilating them. Some were subjected to abuse, rape and malnutrition at schools. One commission in 2015 called it cultural genocide. Today, indigenous communities in the country suffer from higher levels of poverty and violence, as well as shorter life expectancies. Canada's newest holiday is not recognized by some provinces, including its most populous Ontario, where schools, the stock market and most businesses remained open. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Premier of Australia's most populous state, New South Wales, Gladys Berge Killian, resigned today after a corruption watchdog said it was investigating whether she was involved in conduct that constituted or involved a breach of public trust. The third phase of clinical trials for Sputnik V for people over 60 years old has finished showing a high level of safety and efficacy. The vaccine developer is now updating its recommendations for use and is compiling a final report on the test results. Hawaii's Kiliwa volcano, in its first eruption in nearly a year, was filling the crater at its summit with hot red lava and clouding the skies with volcanic smog. The contained eruption is safe for the public, but officials are concerned things could quickly change. Rising cases of dengue fever in India's northern Agra district are becoming a cause of concern for local administration as the delicate health infrastructure struggles to cater to the patients. After years of controversy, Japan's Princess Marco will marry her former classmate, a commoner, this month and give up her royal status. The Imperial Household Agency said the date had been set for 26th October.
And finally tonight, the Walt Disney World Resort is celebrating its 50th anniversary in the most magical way possible. And they want everyone to join Mickey, Minnie and the rest of the Disney family for the fun. For the next 18 months, starting today, Walt Disney World will be hosting ongoing celebrations in honor of its half-century birthday, kicking off with a star-studded long weekend of festivities and continuing with a number of new attractions and updated old favorites. Each of Disney World's theme parks will have special offerings to make the 50th anniversary celebration unique, depending on where you are in the park. In addition to new rides, attractions, entertainment and food offerings that are taking over all four of the parks, the celebration extends beyond the theme parks at Disney Resort Hotels and Disney Springs. Celebrations of the anniversary will continue for 18 months. To mark the occasion, there are new rides like Remy's Ratatouille Adventure and new light show Harmonious. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. I'll be back again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.